As we've proceeded so far in this class, one of the assumptions that we've made is that when people engage in exchange behavior, the economizing behavior, the kinds of things that we've talked about, we've assumed something really important. We've assumed that pe the people involved in those exchanges pay the full cost of those exchanges and receive the full benefits of their choices. But what if that's not true? Right? What if some of the costs of our actions are borne by other people, by people not part of the exchange? And what if some of the benefits of our exchange activity uh, are, go to people who aren't part of that exchange? Right? What about, in other words, effects that our activities have on third parties, people who are not part of the original exchange? What we do in Chapter 10 is we look at this question and we look at the ways in which uh, the uh, actions that we take as part of our exchange behavior can affect other people. Okay, And so the title of this chapter is Externalities and Conflicting Rights. And those two things kind of capture what we're really going to talk about here. So let's start with some definitions. Okay, uh, and The key definition we need to start with is the idea of what we call an externality. And externalities come in two flavors, positive and negative. And essentially, an externality is a cost or a benefit from an action that the decision maker does not take into account. Okay, So if we're engaging in an exchange, a cost or benefit that, that we don't think about, right, that, that redounds to a third party that doesn't matter to us, right, and one we don't account for, is an externality. And we can distinguish those externalities, by the way, from costs and benefits. So if I go to Starbucks and I pay $4 for a latte, the $4 is not, and the latte are not externalities. Those are just the costs and benefits of my engaging in that behavior. The externalities are things that influence, that impact other people. So let's, let's look at examples here, and that'll, that'll help clarify this, right? So what we call a negative externality is when there's a cost that people aren't considering, a cost of our exchange behavior that's borne by other people. Right, that other people feel the cost of something we've done. They bear the cost of our choices uh, that they didn't that they didn't consent to, that weren't part of the exchange that they engaged in. A positive externality is when our exchange behavior or our other kinds of action benefit third parties uh, in ways that they also didn't consent to or, or you know or, uh, weren't part of the weren't part of the exchange. So a negative externality is when there's a cost not being considered. Positive externality when there's a benefit not being considered. So let's look at some examples. Go back to the very beginning of the class, right, when we talked about cars getting on the road. When you get on the road and the addition of your car on the road makes traffic more difficult for other people, that's a negative externality, okay? Uh, when you come into a classroom, for example, sometimes you come into a classroom and the, the previous uh, professor has not erased the board or has moved all the chairs around and forcing us to bear the cost of, 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 of uh, undoing what they did, negative externality, all right? Or people who talk during class, making it harder for the rest of the class to, to hear, right? Their, their behavior, or if they're people who also have their computers open and are watching something on YouTube or whatever, right, that distract other people. Those are all negative externalities, okay? One of the most famous externalities, of course, negative externalities, is pollution, when people's uh, production activity negatively impact others. On the positive side, we can think of some examples here, too. Suppose I repaint my house, right? Uh, now, some of the benefit of doing that comes to me, right? My house looks better, it's worth more, but it also makes the neighborhood look better and it will have some impact on the value of my neighbor's houses and, and that's a benefit to them. Same with I mowed my lawn and so on. Think about music played outside a dorm room window, right? So you're walking by and someone's got music going on in their room and loud enough for you to hear out, you know, on, uh, outside the window. Can be a positive externality, right? If you enjoy it, if it's music you don't like, might be a negative externality. Another good example of a positive externality is a good question during a review session or, or on the, on the discussion forums that we've had. If you ask a really good review question, you get a good answer, but you also benefit other people as well. Again, externalities are not the same as costs and benefits. If you pay $4 for that latte, the $4 you pay is not a negative externality, it's just the cost. The fact that you like the latte, it tastes good to you, that's the benefit. That's not a positive externality. Now, if you go into Starbucks, right, and there, and one of the things about Starbucks, of course, it always smells so good, okay? And, if, and to the degree that your latte helps make the room smell better, great, right? And I often, you know, students will come to class sometimes with really good smelling drinks or really good smelling food, right? And you can say that's a positive externality. I didn't consent to it. I wasn't part of the exchange. But the fact that they bought that coffee or that food, right, uh, provides me with a benefit. The key to understanding why economists are concerned with negative and positive externalities is that ne 
with negative externalities, the concern is people will do too much of this since they don't bear all the costs. Think about pollution. If I don't bear the cost, right, of dumping stuff into the water, I'm going to keep doing it because there's no penalty for me for doing it. On the other hand, positive externalities, the concern is people won't do enough of this. I won't paint my house often enough because I don't capture all of the benefits of doing so. Now, that might or might not be true, but that's the concern that economists have, right? Now, negative externalities tend to be the one that we focus on the most because we, the idea of sort of, you know, imposing costs on other people, right, is, is one that, that really bugs us, okay? Um, and we'd like to, if we can, get rid of negative externalities. We don't want to impose costs on other people if it's all possible. But completely eliminating negative externalities isn't possible. One reason is transaction costs. So let's take the example from the textbook. I like to call it the 6.30 in the morning motorcycle. So suppose you have an apartment complex, and one person who lives in this apartment complex has a motorcycle. And this person likes to start it up every morning at 6.30. Perhaps he's going to work or whatever the case may be. And the motorcycle is very loud, and it frequently wakes up people who might, might still be sleeping. Okay? So clearly this is a negative externality. He's imposing a cost. I mean, he bought this motorcycle from someone else, right? He's imposing a cost on his neighbors here. And the question is, how do we deal with this? How do we stop this problem? Okay, in the, the language of economics, how do we internalize the externality? How do we somehow get him to take into account, right, the fact that you're imposing this cost, uh, recognize that you're imposing it, and take it into account? So we can think of two very broad strategies with our motorcyclist here, right? What are the two ways we could do this? Well, one option, of course, is perhaps the obvious one in terms of sort of obvious economic solution. We could just pay him to stop, right? We could say, look, you're really bugging us. Right? We'll, we'll each chip in some money and we'll pay you, say, $100 a month or $200 a month to knock it off, right? To, to, to just take your, uh, take, take your noisy motorcycle elsewhere or maybe, you know, take the 200 bucks and buy a muffler for it or something, right? That would, that would get him to stop. That's one possible, so that would solve the problem, right? The other solution, of course, right, is that he could pay the residents to put up with the noise. He might say to them, look, I love my motorcycle. I love to start. I love to hear it in the morning. I'm willing to pay you guys a few bucks a month, right, to be able to continue to start my motorcycle this way. Would this solve the problem? It would if he paid him enough, right? You might say, well, I mean, I, you know, I don't like being woken up every once in a while, but he's going to pay me 10 bucks a month or something like that, right? I might do it. It might be worth it to me. There's a price at which, anyway, it would be. Think about you know, the slope of demand curves, right? At some price, you'd be willing, you'd be willing to do this. The interesting questions here are, which one of those solutions is more likely? And what do those say about the rights that people have, right? Because if we have to pay him to stop, that suggests that he has the right to do that, and we have to somehow convince him to stop. If he has to pay us off to put up with the noise, that suggests that we have a right to sleep, a right to quiet, that if he's going to violate that, he's somehow got to compensate us for it, right? So one of the interesting questions that we think about when we think about this issue, right, is who's got the rights and how does that determine which way this goes, all right? And so, again, think about the motorcycle exam here, but notice something interesting, right? There are two possible solutions here. Now, there's, there's other ways, right, that this could be resolved, okay? I mean, he might find out that he's really bothering his neighbors and care a lot about them, and he just values not bothering them, and he stops, right? He values not offending them, right? They could leave him a note. They could also call the cops to have a check. There's all kinds of ways that they, they could conceivably address it. One thing you might also think about is how many negative externalities we deal with every day. If we were in a real classroom right now, I'd sort of pick on someone who's wearing, you know, uh, let's say a, a hat or a shirt with a team sports logo from a team I dislike. Some, you know, someone wearing like a Blackhawks jersey or shirt or something like that, right? Or, you know, teams that, that, that I don't like. I'd be, oh, you know, I can say. That's imposing a negative action. I, mean, I can't even stand the sight of a Chicago Blackhawks logo on anything. It just, as a Red Wings fan, it just drives me crazy. I can't stand it. Or, I, you know, if you were wearing some particularly bright color, right, you know, that might, I might be bothered by that. Or if you were wearing a t-shirt with a, with a musical artist, I can't stand. Same sort of thing, right? We, we have this all the time, right? Think about all the times you're maybe on the bus next to someone whose music is too loud or clearly hasn't showered for a couple days, right? Or is talking too loudly on their cell phone. All of these things are negative externalities. The interesting question is, do we try to solve all of them? We don't, right? In fact, if we do, we're considered kind of jerks. Right? If you walk around all the time going, that's a really ugly sweater. God, I hate that Blackhawks hat. Right? You stink. 
right? Would you turn your damn music down, right? We, we, you know, to some degree, not all the time, but to some degree, we just, we just put up with that. We don't feel the need to respond to each and every one. And you might, you know, would it be a better world if we did? Probably not, right? Because we'd be, you know, we'd be always on each other and always uh, telling each other to knock it off or whatever the case is. So that suggests that, tr that there's costs of getting rid of the problems of negative externalities, right? That, that we can't get rid of them all. Some we're just going to put up with. Is the motorcycle that kind of example? Maybe, maybe not. What we do know, what we're going to talk about here, are three different ways that we can attempt to resolve negative externalities. Negotiation, adjudication, and legislation. In this um, first of the two videos for this chapter, I'm just going to talk about negotiation. We'll talk about the other two uh, in the next one. Okay. So negotiation is exactly this kind of thing here that we're talking about with the 6.30 in the morning motorcycle. Okay. The cost bearer right, might accept the cost, because they've been compensated in some sort of way. So I might put up with the motorcycle, you know, being, being the noise being imposed upon me, right, if the motorcycle owner is compensating me. Now notice, right, that suggests, okay, that I'm, I'm bearing the cost. By the way, you can think of it the other way, right? We're imposing a cost on the motorcycle guy if we tell him to knock it off, right? And he doesn't like that. To him, that's a cost. He loves starting his motorcycle. He'll put up with bearing that cost, not starting at 630, if we pay him enough to compensate him, right? So compensating people for their, for their costs, right? And what's interesting about when you start to think about negative externalities this way, you can see it's a cost on both parties. Even think about something like pollution. We tend to think that the cost goes one way, right? The cost is the, 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 the factory that's polluting the water or the air or whatever it is. And that's certainly true. But it's also the case if you, if we, impose upon the factory. You can't do that. That's a cost to them. They have to change their behavior in all kinds of ways, right? So either party will accept that cost if they can be sufficiently compensated to do so. And so one way to do that is that the parties negotiate. And you can imagine the motorcyclist and the uh, apartment dwellers negotiating. You can imagine other kinds of negotiation. You can, you know, imagine one of your neighbors is constantly, you know, flinging their dog poop over into your yard, right? If, you know, you can imagine a negotiation that would, would take place there. But notice something about negotiation. It requires clearly defined and well-enforced property rights. You have to know who has the rights. You have to know, do you have a right to a poop-free backyard? Do you have a right to clean water or clean air? Or do you have a right to do with your you know, outputs from your factory, whatever you want? So one of the most important things is that, that in order for negotiation to take place, those property rights have to be clearly defined. We have to know who has the rights. Does, do, the, do the apartment dwellers have the right to quiet, or does the motorcyclist have a right to start his motorcycle whenever he wants to? All right? and, and which party has the rights will determine which way the payment goes, right? Because if you're violating the other people's rights, you're going to have to compensate them for that rights violation if you want to continue to do what you're doing. Notice something else here too, transaction costs, right, are important, okay? One of the problems in solving the apartment complex issue is how do you get all the people in the apartment complex together to agree on this and approach the guy? No matter what you're going to do, leave him a note, call the cops, whatever. Coordinating all that behavior or think about the victims of pollution. How do you find out who's been hurt by polluted water, polluted air? How do you get them together to, to respond to all of this? So the other thing that has to be true for negotiation to work well is you have to be able to have all the parties to the negotiation at the table, and that requires low transaction costs. And what this leads to is one, uh, one of the more interesting results in economics, which is known as the Coase Theorem, after Ronald Coase, who was a very famous economist, lived to be 102, still writing books when he was 100, which is awesome, and we should all aspire to that. What the Coase theorem says, and, and there's, you know, sometimes people put Coase theorem in quotes because there's a big debate over how important Coase thought the Coase theorem was. But whatever we call it, the idea is important. And the idea goes something like the following. If property rights are clearly defined and transaction costs are sufficiently low, negative externality problems can be solved by negotiation. So if we know who has the right to sleep or start the motorcycle, if the members of the apartment complex have a low enough transaction cost that they can organize and get together, that problem can be solved by negotiation. Now, who will pay and who will get compensated depends on who has the rights. But as long as the rights are clearly defined, we can solve, it doesn't matter who has them, we can solve the problem through negotiation. On the other hand, if transaction costs are high, if it's hard for the department dwellers to organize, who has the property rights matters a lot. Because if they can't get organized, 
they won't be able to defend their right to quiet against against his uh, right to start the motorcycle, or if he does have a start, right, right to start the motorcycle. So they, they won't be able to figure out a way to, to get him to, to give up that right. So if transaction costs are high, right, the, the sort of pure result of the Coase theorem doesn't hold. It's going to, negotiation is going to be uh, more difficult, and what's go, it's going to matter who has the rights, right? What, what the interesting result of the Coase theorem is, if transaction costs are low and the rights are clearly defined, it doesn't matter who has them. Right, we can always solve the problem. So if both parties to the, you know, uh, to the motorcycle issue can get together and negotiate, it doesn't matter who has the rights. Whoever does have them, there's an opportunity for the other group to compensate them uh, for the rights being violated or having to give up that that right. And so the problem can be solved. And notice, solving the problem right here doesn't mean that the activity stops. He might still start his motorcycle at 6:30 every day, but if he's but if he's paying the residents to put up with it, there's no negative externality anymore, right? What he's doing is simply an exchange, right? And what the Coase theorem says, transaction costs are low, property rights are clearly defined, you can turn negative externality problems into opportunities for gains from exchange. And that's a really important result. It matters in the real world. It's a starting point for thinking about problems of pollution and other kinds of things in the real world. It can't solve them all, and in a moment we'll uh, we'll turn to the second video and we'll start to talk about the uh, the other ways or other situations where where we have to where we have to use other techniques to solve these problems. But we want negotiation first because what negotiation does is eliminate what looks like a negative externality by turning it into what the much more familiar situation of an exchange. And and we've got as we've seen so far this semester a pretty good understanding of how that works and why it's good. So summing up. Negative externalities are, are a problem that we'd like to eliminate. We can't eliminate them all. We've got some ways to try to eliminate them, negotiation, adjudication, legislation. Negotiation's our first choice because, again, it takes those negative externality problems, turns them into exchange situations, uh, at least when the, when the assumptions of the Coase theorem hold. And even when they don't, right, even if, if, if transaction costs are high, at the very least, um, we know, you know who has the rights matters, but there's still scope for negotiation there. Uh, it's just not going to work out as nicely, perhaps, as, as when, the, when the transaction costs are low. So, and a really important under, uh, idea to understand when we think about this idea of, of negative externalities, how we might solve them. In the next video, we're going to take a look quickly at, a, at adjudication and legislation, and then we're going to talk about some other kinds of ways in which uh, the economic way of thinking can be applied to uh, other kinds of environmental problems. So we'll come back in the second video and do that.